Center stage, center stage, center, center, center stage. Center stage. I remember seeing Psycho as a really young man and just being totally mesmerized. And then reading that the shower scene, the knife never pierces the woman's skin. Right, right. I don't know what they used to, to make that blood, but that black fluid that you would see at her feet and then her face, just amazing. Yeah, and any other director would have made it much gorier. OK, he didn't have to do that. He was such a he just got how you do these things. There's no, nobody like him. I also like the way that he brought in humor, like when he would do ads for his movies oh, yeah. or his cameos or then when he did his series. For Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which is a very popular half hour television program, which he introduced each time. He did one one week supposedly naked in a barrel. Other weeks have all these weird costumes. Can you imagine Scorsese doing that or Spielberg or any or any other director who was so concerned with the gravitas, they wouldn't have even thought of doing that. I thought it was interesting how uh, Tibby Hedren, you write about uh, when she was doing birds. Was it true that they attached some of the birds to her body so that they were? Yeah, on the wow. fifth day. And imagine that. First of all, they were going to use mechanical birds, but the mechanical birds didn't work to get the terrifying images they want. So they tell them on a Monday morning they're going to use real birds. Okay, you go in there, maybe they do it for 10 minutes, you get the shot and you go on. He did it for five days. And the fifth day, he, he, he attached some of them onto her arm and they almost plucked out her eyes. Yeah, I read that she was bruised after yeah, all shooting. Over. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't because he was conscious of being cruel. He just didn't give a damn what happened to you for him to get the shots he wanted to get. Madeline Carroll in the 39 Steps. There's a scene in the, in, in the film where he, the, the two stars are, are, are handcuffed together. They come in the first day, they didn't even know who Hitchcock was. And he, 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 he's not even going to shoot it, but he handcuffs them together and pours water all over them, okay? And makes them do that for hours. And when they want to go to the bathroom, he doesn't even want to let them go to the bathroom. Well, <laughs> they bonded. And they did a great job in the movie, but at, at a considerable price. Were you surprised at how mean he was to his actresses? Would we put mean in quotes? I mean, he's going to get what he wants out of them and he doesn't care. And he does take pleasure in humiliating people that that was the part of this man and and a part that one doesn't like i interviewed kim novak she's bipolar but she wasn't diagnosed until after she left hollywood but she struggled with that her whole life hitchcock put her down and anybody who's watched it i think would say she deserved to have been nominated for an academy award she was that wonderful in that film i love the scene when they go shopping and uh, jimmy stewart he wants her to wear what this other person right. that he's seen. And um, they're shopping and she wants this dress. And he goes, no, do that dress. And the lady says, I believe Monsieur knows what Madame wants. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole audience, because we went to, uh, there was a screening in Westwood. You know, it was uh, the 50th anniversary of the film or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And we just all laughed because you can't, that's, that's just so dated talk, but that's the way it was back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Games. And he and he and he was kind of nasty to her when they when they when they, they shot the outside scenes in San Francisco and they came back in the studio and she was she's so nervous, how is she gonna do? And the first day she goes into the dressing room and there's a chicken on her window, a dead chicken on the window and on the mirror in her in her dressing room. And she is She said to me, "I don't know what I don't know what it meant. I don't know what it means." But all the men came up and sort of laughed. Wow! It, did, it didn't help her in in to perform to act that day to to start the morning that way. Do you think that he liked actors, or they were just a necessary means? I think he he liked them no more than he liked to share in, in in the movie or something. They were just part of the scenery, part of the devices that he used. Right now, as we sit here, you've got a really solid body of work, but was it always like that for you? And what were those things that, those challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those? I, I struggled for a long, long time and I got a divorce and I started over with $500. Wow. And, and I did 
a book about a man called Willie Unseld, who was a mountain climber, climbed Everest in 63. And I was in the Peace Corps in 64 to 66. And he was the director of the Peace Corps. It was his story and the tragedy of his daughter's death. Robert Redford uh, was going to make it into a movie. In fact, Robert Redford went to Nepal and almost died there. And he loved the book. In fact, a few years ago, he was on the cover of Architectural Digest. And there, there was my book of scent just sitting there. But at that point, I didn't have the book. I was, I was, I was researching it. And, and Willie had climbed the Grand Teton in the summer. He was a guide. So I thought I better, I better climb that mountain. But I didn't have any money. And I was in the Grand Tetons. I couldn't afford to run a car. I couldn't afford it. And the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the climber's ranch where I was staying, which was this kind of cabin with all these bunk beds, was seven miles away. And it was pouring rain. It was just unbelievable rain. And I'm walking down this road and I'm thinking I'm 35 years old. What the hell am I doing here? That's amazing that you just kept on because uh, that tells a lot about your character as well. What was it about you that, that did not give up? Well, my wife, when my wife, <laughs> when my wife, when my wife is upset with me, which happens fairly frequently, she says, the, the only thing you can do is write. And uh, that's probably true. I mean, I wouldn't have been a good executive. I would. I, would, I, would, I don't don't like that kind of thing. So I, this this was it. I had to make it work. What led you to be a biographer? The reviews of my one novel probably convinced me that I better not. I wasn't a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> so, Which one was that? I can't remember the name of it. That, it sold about ten copies. Once I got a review, I did Ritigor, the Gilbert Sullivan musical. Right. And the review said, a confident, uh, no, a nervous vibrato betrayed the confident come on of Mark Gordon's limber Richard Dauntless. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you, and you remember that, okay? Yes. Because I remember, I, I, I did this, uh, I was remembering doing this talk in Pittsburgh, and there was this other, t other talk, other guy, a writer, okay? He'd been the head of a publishing company, and then he became a, a very successful popular novelist. We went out and had a few drinks afterwards, and I said, well, uh, what, what's, the main, what's the most important difference between being a top editor and being a writer? And he said, when I was, when I was an editor, uh, I'd read a review, and I'd find the one good line and use that in, in, in the ads and things. And as an author, I read the review, and I find the one bad line, and I remember it forever. How do you go about structuring the book? And tell me a little bit about that, the, the process in doing a, a book like this. Before I write a word, I figure out the ending. I don't, uh, I don't write the ending, but I know what the ending's going to be, and I've got to write a book so that the ending will work out. And the ending of this, this is 1979, the American Film Institute did a, tri did a tribute to Hitchcock. I mean, he was too old for this, and he was, you know, he was very close to dying, and, and his wife had had a stroke. It was a question even if they'd show up that evening. And they showed up, and he could hardly walk into, into the theater and sit down. And Ingrid Bergman, who, who starred in three of his films, was the master of ceremony. And she looked out. And he's just pathetic. She was, she was so was disgusted that they even do this and take advantage of this man this this night. So so that they went on and his face showed absolutely no emotion or anything during the whole long evening, showing all these incredible clips of his film. And finally, at the end of the evening, Edgar gets up, and she says, "You know, she takes she, she she took out they take out this key." and says, "In notorious, this was the key to the wine to, to the wine cellar, the crucial." crucial element in the movie and Cary Grant, Cary took it and kept it for 10 years and then he gave it to me and I've had it for 10 years and Hitch, I'm coming down there today to you and I'm giving, I'm giving you the key and so everybody, the thousands of people get up and start to applaud Hitch, Hitchcock finally gets up and, and, and she goes through the crowd and comes to him and hugs him and he doesn't like to be hugged but he hugs her back and I end the book with a sense that he wasn't just hugging her. He was hugging life. People come up and say, look, I want you to write this book about Hitchcock, or I want you to write a book about Capote. No, Capote was my idea, which was a bestseller, and is being made into an eight-part series uh, by Ryan Murphy. I was on the set one day and, uh, in New York, 
And that was, it, it, I, I, I was staying in a nearby hotel four blocks away. I started walking and I suddenly see all these trucks from what films. And I think they got to be doing some of the film. These trucks all can't be for this thing, but it was. And I got, I came out, I came in there and uh, they put me in this direct, in this chair. And uh, this long, lanky cowboy looking guy comes up to me and he says, uh, I'm, hi, I'm Gus. And I said, Gus, what do you do? He says, I'm Gus Van Sand. I'm the director. Oh, yeah. The, the, my one regret in writing that book was I knew Joanne Carson. And she was one of Truman's closest friends. Truman, Truman died, in her, died in her arms. Wow. And, and she said, I think falsely, that he, that he said half of the ashes should go to her and half to John Dumpy, his, love, his longtime lover in New York. So, so, so she had him cremated and took half the ashes for herself and half for John Duffy, Dunphy. Uh, a few years later, and she kept them. She kept them in her house. And a few years later, she, said, she called me and said that Truman, before he died, had done a tape for her about how she could do the 80s counterpart of the famous black and white ball at the, at the Plaza Hotel in 1965 after the publication of In Cold Blood. And she said, but Larry, you can't come to the party because uh, if Johnny finds out I'm talking to you, I'm going to lose my alimony. I said, okay. So Halloween morning, she calls and says, you can come. Well, I should know what the last minute invitation means. It means there's a place at the table, right? But she said, you, got, you had to come in costumes so nobody would know who you are. So I went to the costume store. Well, on Halloween morning, what, there's nothing left. There was just one costume, the executioner. So, so I got the executioner. My wife and I put on a my wife put on a pretty gown and, and a mask, and we go to the party. And she invited every star in Hollywood. Every star in Hollywood was invited, and they were all kind of paparazzi there, just waiting. But nobody showed up because they felt if they showed up and Johnny found out, they wouldn't go to Tonight Show. So I come in, and so far no star has come. But here I come in, and the the, the, the executioner, and they're sure I'm a star. Like twenty paparazzi surround me and say, "Take off your mask. We know who you are. We know who you are." So so I went in, and there was there was no Jim Bacchus, Mr. Magoo, who was seen out. Oh, yeah. Was, he was propped up on the sofa, and Esther Williams was there, not looking like in her swimsuit days. That was it. Anyway, and so also People Magazine was there because she had told People Magazine she was going to have all these celebrities, right? But there were no celebrities, and they sure as hell weren't going to do it. So at midnight, you're supposed to take off your mask. Well, I couldn't do that, so my wife and I left right at, right at midnight. Five minutes later, she comes out of the kitchen and says, it's been a thief, a theft a thief has been taken. Somebody's come in. They've stolen Truman's ashes. They've stolen jewelry and they've stolen the final manuscript. And everybody said, we knew it was. It's the executioner who just snuck out. So three days later, she calls me and she, she totally made that up so she'd get her story in People magazine, you know? So three days later, she calls and says, well, the, th the thief has returned the ashes and she's just hysterical. I said, I'll come over, I'll come over and help you. So we drove over and we got in her sports car and I had the ashes or half of Truman's ashes in my lap trying to figure out what to do. And I remember in Westwood, there's a, there's a, there's a place there in Westwood where Marilyn Monroe's ashes are. And I suggested we go there. We went around and, and there was a, there was the, 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 the black suited guy opens his door and everybody is a book. And she thought that was poetic, but the books on either side of Truman weren't authors that that shouldn't do. It. And then there's these creps, there were 36 of them. And she said, that's, for, that's for Truman. But, but she said, but Mrs. Carson, they're all full, but this one is Peter Lawford and the Kennedys have not paid for this. So we're willing to take, Peter Lawford out of there and put Mr. Capote in there. So she cut a price for that, but she couldn't, didn't want to part with her, her half of the ashes, all of them. So she poured half of her ashes into this uh, device and added hundred percent of her dog's ashes and put that in there. It says Truman Capote, but it's a quarter of Truman and hundred percent of the, of the dog's ashes. When she died, they auctioned off her effects and they auctioned off, uh, the ashes, the quarter of the ashes. And the, 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 the auction house was not sure whether they wanted to do it, but they realized one of the major auction houses had recently auctioned off Napoleon's penis for, 40, for $4,800. So they thought, well, we can auction off uh, uh, Capote's uh, ashes. And they did, and it went for $48,000. Oh, my God. Yeah. And the, Ken the Kennedys were too cheap to pay for it. 
<laughs> well, now you've got uh, Andy Warhol. I remember years ago, I covered the film, I Shot Andy Warhol, uh, which I thought was was really fascinating. Yeah. And um, that's going to be exciting, huh? Are you, you really enjoying that project? Yeah, I am. I am. But I just enjoy whatever I'm doing. I get, I, get, I get totally into it. I'm just totally involved with whatever I do. And you know, that's that's what's so great is when you're doing and you're following your bliss and your passion. Right. I bet you just have endless energy. Well, you know, at my age, I'm, I, I'm just, I know I'm blessed, okay? I don't know how much longer it's going to last. And if I can't appreciate it now, there's something wrong with me. Best of luck with the book and with the upcoming series. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to uh, oh, just been with us. Thank you for having us. It was great fun. Hello, this is Homie Simpson. Whenever I want to know what's going on in the entertainment world, I listen to Center Stage with Mark Gordon. Hehehe. <laughs>